You're basically there. There. Should I start? Sure. Good morning. Good morning. Um, welcome to Campground Ministry. It's really a pleasure to be able to be in person to gather because I think out of most everything in community, this is what I've missed the most. So um, let us begin. Well, the other thing is, before I begin, I, I'm changing the reading. Um, I'm not going to read the gospel lesson that's in your uh, program today. I'm switching it to a reading from Exodus. So, let us begin. We gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit as children of God, washed by the cleansing and renewing waters. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. Of the sun, in the name of the sun, in the name of the spirit, in the name of the spirit, three in one, the three in one. Please join me in reading the prayer of the day. You are great, O oh God, God, and greatly to be praised. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call upon you know you, and serve you, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Thy holy winds, O Savior, spread gently over me, and let me rest securely through good and ill with thee. O be my strength and portion, my rock and chapter verses 2 through 8. They had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. The word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Um, the sermon that I'm doing this morning is, uh, I was contemplating based on that scripture, the idea of how do we follow Jesus into 2020? Um, so, with that in mind, in our reading this morning from Exodus, we heard the Lord God say to Moses, You have seen what I, did, what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. 
a reference to God's mighty power in inflicting the 12 plagues on the Egyptians so that they would let my people go. I hope that sounds familiar to you. It is foundational in a Christian child's upbringing, also in a Jewish child's faith life. God's crushing power rescues the Israelites from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. In the Old Testament, we learn of God's love for his chosen people, the Israelites, the forerunners of today's Jewish people. In the reading, God goes on to say that if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Exodus is the second of 39 books of the Old Testament, and I can tell you that the rest of the Old Testament is basically story after story of how this treasured possession of a people failed time after time to obey God and keep the covenant, the agreement with God. The covenant, by the way, is found in Deuteronomy and is part of a sacred prayer called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Loving the one true God is pivotal in the establishment of Judaism, the religion from which Jesus was birthed, and it is thus foundational to us as Christians who follow Jesus. And why did Jesus come here? Jesus came to earth to reveal God's self to human beings, and that is the narrative contained in the 27 books of the New Testament. He came in the flesh, incarnate means to be in the flesh, so as to be like us in form. The formlessness of God thus took on form in the person of Jesus. He didn't come here specifically to start a new religion. He came born as a Jew and grew up embedded in Judaism. He came to offer salvation to all people, not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles. That is to say, every human being. His mission was one of inclusion. He came to show humans the way and the truth and the life. He came to show us how to live as God intended us to live, how to live in right relationship with the one true God who created all things. When Jesus was asked by a Jewish scribe, which commandment is the first of all, he responded with the Shema. The first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus didn't come to earth in a fiery display of power to smash evil like a caped crusader, nor did he come to force himself upon us like a king or emperor uses their brute power. Jesus' power is in his love, in his humility and compassion, and in his identity as the suffering servant who walks aside humankind. Jesus treated the marginalized with love and respect. He spoke to racism against the Samaritans and identified them as neighbors. And he admonished leaders who bent laws to favor themselves while others suffered. Jesus demonstrated that apathy leads to ignorance and injustice. Now in these wild chaotic days of 2020, it can be very hard for us to follow Jesus. We all have singular opinions and we want to be right about our views of the world. We argue a lot, so much in fact that merely having an opinion becomes tantamount to an argument. Community life has become for some a battlefield of conflict. We each have our own unique perspective on the world that formulates how we think the world should be. And as a people, we have become resistant in our empathetic understanding of what other perspectives are like. Thanks to the immediacy of social media, we've regressed from being ignorant of these other viewpoints to vilely trashing people of different beliefs and experiences. We proudly walk in our own shoes while discrediting the people we disagree with. Not just their ideas and opinions, but we seem to have moved on to aggressive attack of those people with whom we disagree. For whatever reasons, and there seem to be new ones each day, we engage in the othering of other people. 
and there is always injustice and othering, the presumptive labeling and lumping of human beings into defined us versus them categories. Jesus, in contrast, loves them all, loves us all, and we are asked to do the same. Following the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus is not an easy journey because something has to change inside of me to do it. What am I willing to let go of in order to do that? Where have I blocked the flow of love toward my neighbor? In the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us, we pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever wondered what God's will is for you? What's the plan? Let me simplify it for you. It's actually the same plan for anyone and everyone. Only the form will differ as we find ourselves in different vocations and locations. So listen up. God's plan for you is to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That's part one. And the second part of your personal plan is to love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. That's God's will to be done on earth. It's not difficult to see it, but admittedly, it's difficult to do it. We will make mistakes. We will need forgiveness. But we must keep trying to allow God's love to be our guiding light toward our neighbors, God's treasured possessions. Our pastor at First Lutheran in Iron River challenged us in his past two sermons to look for the face of Christ, the face of God, and the face of every person you encounter. When you do this, it changes everything. You can never be the same. There is, he said, a reconciliation of sorts between you and God when focusing on the image of God in your neighbor. There is an opportunity here to truly live in what it means to be the image of God when we stop othering. A friend recently told me she was praying for our national leaders. It's always a good thing to lift up in prayer those in positions of leadership. She added her belief that if a person is in a certain position of power, like elected officials are, that must be God's will. She noted that even when she didn't understand how that could possibly be, it must be God's will because earthly realities must be reflective of God's will. As a Lutheran, I strongly disagree with that. God's will and our collective will as the human race can differ markedly, and often they do. For example, do you actually believe that Hitler rose to power in Germany in 1933 because of God's will? I don't believe it was. Yes, God was there in the suffering, just as a Trinitarian God is present in all human joy and suffering. But likely, human decisions allowed Hitler to assume power and maintain it through the Holocaust until his death in 1945. As human beings, we need to take credit for the injustices that we perpetuate here on Earth. It is not all God's will. It is not so cut and dried, so crystal clear. Christianity, sadly, has been weaponized, nationalized, and co-opted for centuries to justify one's own agenda. I believe that's what happened with Germany's Third Reich, but it's also played a huge part in America's ugly history of slavery and slaughter. The point to be made is that people who count themselves as Christian have collectively committed injustices in the world. And so I ask, is that God's will? An easy litmus test is this. If there's no love of neighbor in it, it's not God's plan. If you disagree, please read the gospel. We are not always comfortable with the great mystery of God. Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ will come again. It's murkily unclear. St. Paul writes, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. We want answers we cannot find. We lament the nature of God. Why doesn't God just correct injustice here? If God is omnipotent, all-powerful, then why doesn't God's self just fix our humanly created problems? Though God may be powerful, 
God's nature is not to unleash miraculous displays of power. Instead, God allows. And God works change through us, his disciples, the hands and feet of Christ. An online pastor I listened to recently described God's power like that of a parent who was challenged by his seven-year-old son to race back to the house. The boy takes off with his feet a-flying. He wants to win. He wants to beat Dad. He's laughing, and the expression on his face is simply priceless. The father momentarily takes the lead, which only encourages the kid to run harder. But in the last few seconds, Dad, with his eye on his son, slows up, allowing Junior to surge ahead as the winner. God's power is like that of the dad. It could have dominated and defeated the child he loves, but it didn't. God allows because God loves us. In closing, I'll leave you with this question to ponder when you see injustice. Knowing that God works change through us, his disciples, and in light of America's share of injustices, the question is not why does God allow, but why do we? Let us pray. Amen. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, seek to guide our understanding of those who walk in different shoes. Guide our leaders to rule with humility and compassion. Forgive us for weaponizing our relationships and institutions, for being loveless and blind to the pain and suffering of others, your treasured possessions. Turn our self-righteous swords into God-righteous plowshares, sowing seeds of grace in our world, our country, and our communities for the sake of Jesus Christ who died for us. Amen. 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 our common faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. There will now be a free will offering. Well, actually, uh, no? there's the buckets that you can drop your offering in on the way out rather than pass it around during the service. Well, we will sing the doxology. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Called into unity with 
one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. We pray for the faithful. Sustain us as we share your word. Embrace us as we struggle to find our common ground. Lift up leaders with powerful and prophetic voices. Free us from stagnant faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the well-being of creation. Protect the air, water, and land from abuse and pollution. Free us from apathy in our care of creation and direct us towards sustainable living. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the nations, especially the United States and Canada, celebrating their nationhoods. Guide leaders in developing just policies and guide difficult conversations. Free us from patriotism that hinders relationship building. Lead us to expansive love for our neighbor. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all in need, for all who are tired, feeling despair, sick, or oppressed. Take their yoke upon you and ease their burdens. Give your consolation and free us from all that keeps us bound. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We give thanks for those who have died in faith. Welcome them into your eternal rest and comfort us in our grief until we are joined with them in new life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The last song is... What a friend. What a friend we have in me.
bless and keep you. May the Lord bless and keep you. Lift His countenance upon you. Lift His countenance upon you. His blessing go with you. His blessing go with you. the Lord. Thanks be to God. You're on your way appropriately. <laughs> the seriousness has ended. <clears throat> when my wife and I arrived at a car dealership to pick up our car after service, we were told the keys had been locked in it. We went to the service department and found a mechanic working feverishly to unlock the driver's side door. As I watched from the passenger side, I instinctively tried the door handle and discovered that it was unlocked. Hey, I announced to the technician. It's open. His reply, I know. I already did that side. Oh. And the, the, the watchword is to stay alert when you're at dealerships. Anyway. <clears throat> and uh, here's one for us. Uh, an elderly man, thinking his wife was losing her hearing, went about 20 feet behind her and asked, Can you hear me, sweetheart? No reply. Moved to 10 feet and inquired again. No reply. Five feet. Not a word. A few inches behind her, he asked, Can you hear me now, honey? His wife said, For the fourth time, yes. <laughs> and here's one for all of us that enjoy a cocktail or something. Knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. Philosophy is wondering if a Bloody Mary counts as a smoothie. <laughs> so have that smoothie this morning when you leave. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great Sunday, folks. Good song. It's a good song, but not normally. Almost the same chord.